but somebody needs to say it somebody needs to get to the bottom of all this these conflicting studies and all this and just tell you the truth here's what's going on <sighs> let's talk about soy I have here some scientific research papers we're going to go into and I have here a picture of some structures, some chemical structures. It's chemistry, and you don't have to be a chemist, but just look at this picture of estrogen, estradiol. Okay, we've got four rings, and you can just see the general structure here. But look here, this is a picture of the structure of phytoestrogen found in soy. All right, look how similar it is, almost identical. Here's a picture of BPA, which isn't nearly as similar, but it's still similar to, to estrogen. And in case you don't believe me, I put a picture of a fatty acid, which is obviously completely different than all of these estrogenic chemicals. So one of the interesting things about soy is because the structure is so similar to estrogen, a lot of people and a lot of scientists, especially vegetarians, like to say that soy is beneficial, it's healthy, because it actually acts like estrogen in our body in a positive way. I was just talking about this with Ben Greenfield on his podcast, and there's some legitimacy to that idea, but let's talk about it. Let's go into depth on soy and really get to the bottom of this thing. Start with this paper, negative paper about soy, in a journal called Cerebrovascular Diseases Journal from 2005. And it's called Phytoestrogens as a Risk Factor for Cerebral Sinus Thrombosis blood clots in the brain basically all right and this shouldn't surprise you that soy would be a phytoestrogen from soy would be a risk factor for clotting because birth control is a risk factor all these artificial estrogens increase your risk for blood clotting issues and they say in this paper some vegetables namely soy have estrogen like compounds that are sometimes used to decrease menopause related symptoms all right, we present a case of cerebral sinus thrombosis with no, risk, no identifiable risk factors besides the use of isoflavones, a phytoestrogen compound. Isoflavones, that's the, that's the phytoestrogen in soy like we talked about in the last episode. Okay, this is a case study. What happened? They had a 52-year-old woman. She had a two-month history of continuous headaches. Wow. She had been following the alternative, an alternative medicine treatment for menopause symptoms with isoflavones. She'd been using soy. If somebody tells you to supplement soy, don't do it. Um, it's a good example of why. Let's talk about another health issue with soy. 2008, the Journal of Human Reproduction got a paper here called Soy Food and Isoflavone Intake in Relation to Semen Quality Parameters Among Men from an Infertility Clinic. Okay, so they, this paper starts by saying high isoflavone intake. Isoflavones, phytoestrogen, that's the estrogen chemical in soy. High, isofla high isoflavone intake has been related to decreased fertility in animal studies. But data in humans is scarce, they say. Why is data in humans scarce? Because everybody's eating soy. We're all eating soy. It's hard to study this. It's a problem. It's just like the plastics. Everybody's being exposed to plastics makes it difficult. In the animal models, it's crystal clear. There's all these health problems. There's infertility. Same with plastics. Humans, it's harder. Okay, here's the results. There was an inverse association between soy food intake and sperm concentration that remained significant after accounting for age, BMI, body mass index, caffeine, smoking, all these, all these other things. They, they, they uh, accounted for all these variables. And they still found this inverse association between soy and infertility. What does that mean? That means as people ate more soy, they had less, they were less fertile, these men. All right? And as they had less soy, they were more fertile. It's as simple as that. So fertility, that's an issue. Okay, let's look at this paper. This one's really good. I like this one from 2014 in Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine. This is a review paper. And the reason I like it is because they show you the benefits from soy and the risks from soy, and they do a good job being thorough. This paper is called Soy Foods and Supplementation, a review of commonly perceived health benefits and risks. 
Okay, so benefits, let's talk about it. So they say here, the authors have conducted a comprehensive assessment of, you know, the soy literature, the, the research on soy. What do they find? Five health benefits. What are they? Relief of menopause symptoms, of course. Again, it acts like estrogen. You should expect that. Prevention of heart disease, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and osteoporosis. All right, so we're finding a lot of positive benefits here. People talk about this all the time. You've probably heard of these positive benefits. But get this. They find also five health risks. Increased risk of breast cancer. <laughs> Wait, they just said there's a decreased risk of breast cancer and the risks are increased risk. Okay, that doesn't make sense, but we'll go on. Male hormonal and fertility problems. We talked about that. That's a big serious issue. Hypothyroidism, that means problems with the thyroid gland. When I was on the uh, Primal Blueprint podcast at Mark Sisson's house, L. Russ, L-E-E-E-L-L-E, -E 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 -L, -L, -E. L. Russ, she uh, interviewed me and she wrote a great book on this and she was a real expert when she was talking to me about this, hypothyroidism, thyroid problems, especially from soy. Anyways, anti-nutrient content and harmful processing byproducts. So, so those are some of the harmful pro problems with soy. But get this, this is even more interesting. Soy does not appear to offer protection against osteoporosis. Okay, so that was listed as a benefit. Let's take soy to make our bones stronger. They've done the research, they looked at all the studies, and they say, yeah, it doesn't really appear to actually work. It's just a claim. Next, the evidence on male fertility and reproductive hormones was conflicting because some studies demonstrated deleterious impacts caused by soy consumption, and others showed no effect. Okay, so it's either negative or there's, it's neutral. Makes sense? And then they say soaking, fermentation, and heating make reduce problematic anti-nutrients contained in soy. So let's talk about that. And first, I want you to know in the next episode, we're gonna talk about scientific spin because I think that's a bigger issue. Fermentation causes, a, fermentation, heating, some of these processing, uh, you know, processing techniques, they cause changes in soy and it causes a lot of conflicting research, but also, there's a lot of bias when there's money involved in soy research. So we'll talk about that next episode. First, let's get into the science of fermentation and what happens to phytoestrogen, these soy estrogens. So for that, I've got a paper here, 2007, from the Institute of Food Technologists Journal, and it's called Production of Beta-Galactosidase and Hydrolysis of Isoflavone. Again, that's the phytoestrogen in soy phytoestrogens by these various bac bacteria species in soy milk. All right, lactobacillus, acidophilus, anyway, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, so what they, what they did was they, they stored soy milk. They put some bacteria, probiotic bacteria, in soy milk for 28 days. Obviously, they're trying, they're achieving fermentation. And then they looked at these phytoestrogens, these estrogens from soy. And what do they find? a decrease in the concentration of glycosides, beta-glycosides, okay? Remember that word, glycoside. And an increase in the concentration of aglycones was significant. So they say that essentially fermenting soy milk was likely to improve the biological functionality of soy milk, all right? Fermenting it because you're, you're getting rid of some of these glycosides and you're changing them to, the bacteria of course, are changing them to aglycones. So that's what's going on. Again, it's a little bit complex, but somebody needs to say it. Somebody needs to get to the bottom of all this, these conflicting studies and all this and just tell you the truth. Here's what's going on. Phytoestrogens are being converted. Aglycones, positive probably, or at least neutral to your health. Whereas these non-fermented soy products, bad for your health. It's that simple. Let me show you one more paper just to kind of reiterate. This is from 2015, International Journal of Molecular Science Journal, and it's a review paper, and it's called Possibility of Breast Cancer Prevention, Use of Soy Isoflavones and Fermented Soy Beverage Products Using Probiotics. Okay, they're talking about preventing breast cancer here with soy. How do you do that? Yeah, you've got to ferment the soy. Let's be honest, basically, is what they're saying. So they say most isoflavones in soy milk are present as glycosides. Remember, I told you to remember that term? Boom, there it is, glycosides. But 
they are converted to aglycones by fermentation. And then they say, okay, in other words, you have this nasty thing, convert it to a good thing. Nasty in terms of your fertility, nasty in terms of your blood clotting, maybe. Certainly nasty in terms of your thyroid. But it's converted to this either neutral thing or this positive thing for your health. Um, they also say, and it's important to note, that this varies greatly depending on the type of bacteria present. Okay, so the different species, maybe some good gut bacteria convert glycosides to aglycones better. All right, but irrespective of that, things like, like we talked about last time, you see really low content of phytoestrogens in actual fermented soy products. But the problem in America, oftentimes we shortcut the manufacturing process and we, we just cheat the process and don't actually do fermentation. We mimic fermentation. We end up with a lot of phytoestrogens. It's harmful for your health in my opinion. And next time we're gonna to have to talk about the scientific bias, especially as it relates to soy research.